Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, Stuart, um, before just um, getting into my opening statement, I would like to dispose of a particular matter um, which I think is important, and that is that the space that we are in and the space that we are required to hold this debate is not neutral. Uh, this space uh, last year declared itself institutionally racist, um, and we think that the fact that a debate about colonial legacy and about institutional racism is taking place in a space that is in itself institutionally racist is a problematic that we must engage as we continue this debate. But I do want to say that um, I do want to urge you uh, as we debate this tonight to pay attention to not only the polarized statue debate um, that is going on and that has been presented in the media as our only demand or our only uh, mission as Roads Must Fall. We have a broad um, program uh, that we um, are advocating for at Oxford and that interrogates how patterns of exclusion function at Oxford. We are interrogating the exclusion of black and minority ethnic voices in the curriculum. We are interrogating the ways in which Oxford remains a space that is exclusive um, to black professors, for example. We don't think that an Oxford University that purports to be inclusive in the 21st century can only have one full-time black professor. We think there's something deplorable about that. And we are raising these issues using the statue as an emblem under which we are sparking the debate. We are also talking about other things relating to the composition of the student body. We find it deplorable that there are only 24 black British students that have been accepted uh, for last year into the undergraduate student body simply because Oxford, um, again, um, only selects its students from particular elite private schools um, and some public schools. And we think there is a statement to be made about how structures of exclusion persist at Oxford. Uh, and that is what I would urge you to engage going forward. The broad goals of the movement that we have articulated in the democratic general assemblies that we've held at Oxford. Um, and yes, it's not just about the statue, and I'm hoping for substantive engagement tonight on the broad um, issues that we are raising. Thank you very much, Takozo. I now turn to Yasmin Kumi for your opening statement. Thank you. I'm going to remain seated because it's much more comfortable now that we started the trend. What I want to strongly highlight tonight is three points. First, it's personally clear to me that the necessity to remove the statue is unavoidable. Secondly, I think, and equally to what Tokozo said, that the debate tonight should be about a broader issue, which is institutional racism and the decolonization of education within Oxford, a topic that we urgently need to talk about. The third point I'm going to, going to make is that Roads Must Fall is not a movement of a minority of black students. It's actually a movement across skin color that demands all of us to engage. And I hope that each and every single person of you in this room is going to engage with it tonight. Now, why do I think that the statue debate is actually a no-brainer for me? I think that because we're asking the question whether roads must fall. When we say must, we actually call upon conventions within our society that allow us to refer to something as an obligation, that allow us to say whether something is wrong or whether something is right. To me, it's evi evident that a leader who led the ideology of the century-long supremacy of the Anglo-Saxon race, such as Rhodes, does not deserve the glorification through an elevated statue at Oxford University, despite the fact that he has rendered money into scholarships. As a half-German, I can assure you that we do not have a single statue of Hitler in our country, despite the money he invested into infrastructural systems we are benefiting from until date. Yes, I'm comparing Rhodes and Hitler, not because I have counted the lives they have taken, but because the danger of their crimes lied in their racist ideologies. Now, how does the Africa society that I'm speaking for tonight view this debate? You know, to be honest, we have quite a strong representation of students from West Africa in the Africa society. Quite a few of them are not active members of Rhodes Must Fall Oxford. Rhodes' footprint mainly was in Southern Africa. The identification with Rhodes as an image is not as straightforward for non-Southern African students. 
But if you ask them whether they think that there's a problem about colonized education in Oxford or a problem with institutional racism in Oxford, they would all have their stories to share. Which is why our members voted last term that 90% of them are supportive of collaborating with Votes Must Fall on selected issues. So here I'm standing saying that I think what has to fall the most is institutional racism in Oxford, and I'm happy to give more examples about that later in our debate. What I would like to say at last is what I experienced about the movement and why I'm saying it's not a black movement. At the protest in Michaelmas term in front of Oyo College, we had more white particip participants than black participants. A minority cannot free itself from being suppressed in one or the other way in an education institution like Oxford. It demands that the majority is equally engaging, which is why I'm sitting here tonight to engage with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Yasmin. I now turn to Asanangam Soenkopo for your opening statement. Thank you. Um, it's true that the statue is, for us as Rose Must Fall, emblematic of something that's a lot more problematic and perhaps more damning to the experience of black and minority students who are in this environment. But the statue itself is, as a result, then very important for us to interrogate and for us to do a way up, considering how it is that statues function in society. We think that statues function to reflect the ways in which institutions, societies imagine themselves. And being at that Oxford University has all of these structural problems we put before you, we think that them having a statue of Cecil John Rhodes overlook us on High Street at the entrance of Oriel College on a pedestal is very problematic, considering that when Oxford broadcasts itself to the world, it says it is open, it is inclusive, it is a leading 21st century global institution. We think then, what Max Price says at the removal of the Rhodes statue at UCT in Cape Town is really important, that the position of Rhodes statue on UCT campus said something about the values of that university. So this ought to be a debate about, at least insofar as the statue is concerned, the ways in which Oxford University wants to portray itself and the ways in which it imagines itself. Putting a plaque next to it, putting a, 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 a sign under it, is very difficult to engage when that statue stands in living color, life size, above us all on High Street. Because in societies, statues are to commemorate, are to glorify those people whose ideas and whose actions have, um, have given us a way through which to travel history as we imagine ourselves to be. So the way up for Oxford University in terms of keeping the statue there or removing the statue is about saying how the university wants to imagine itself and the ways in which its configuration affects the lives of those people affected by empire all throughout the Global South. We urge you in this debate to think very carefully about what it is that the university has to lose when it removes that statue and, re and replaces it with someone or something that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I now turn to Professor Richard Drayton for your opening statement. I admire Rhodes. I fully confess it. And when his time comes, I shall buy a piece of the rope for a keepsake. So said Mark Twain. Rhodes's contemporaries <laughs> thought him at best a scoundrel, stock manipulator, briber, bully, and at worst a criminal. Leckie suggested he should be jailed. Rhodes, Chesterton wrote, invoked slaughter, violated justice, and ruined republics. In 1899, almost 100 including the Master of Balliol, both Proctors, the Librarian of Bodley, and the Cream of Intellectual Oxford, including Mr. Bigger's predecessor in the Chair of Theology, signed a memorial against Rhodes receiving an honorary degree. Contrary to what you have heard, the best spirits of his age held Rhodes in a contempt equal to our own. But these voices were written out of history by the free speech of Rhodes's money. Even more silenced were the tens of thousands of African victims of his regime. Rhodes did not give to Oxford. He sought to buy its soul. 
He sought to launder his reputation, and there were enough venal dons to take his blood diamonds. He and his proxies paid for memorials, portraits, and statues for him on a Stalinist scale. Many contemporaries thus saw the 1911 new buildings of Oriel, with roads above kings and bishops, sneering across at the university church, as vulgar, if not idolatrous, with Evelyn War in 1930 urging it be dynamited. So what we have there on the high street as a statue is a piece of PR in stone, an expression of a minority party interest in dubious taste, which was foisted onto 20th century Oxford. But the case for roads falling is not about the past, but the present. Look at your classrooms, common rooms, curricula. Talk to a representative group of people of color, if you can even find one in your college, about their experiences here. Oxford, with its best liberal intentions, remains color-coded white. And the complacency with which Oxford and Britain face their racial and colonial pasts is quite central to this. We have a right and a duty to change Oxford. Every country in Europe other than Britain, not just Germany, not just Russia, but France and Spain and Italy and Portugal, have removed statues and renamed streets in order to free the future from symbolic slavery to past evils. Oriel's Road similarly belongs behind a museum glass rather than the high. There is a poetic sweetness that the Rhodes scholarships through which Rhodes intended to diffuse the despotic culture of British imperialism to the world has instead become the spur for Oxford and Britain to question that past and to begin to free themselves towards the future. that, Professor. I now turn to Professor William Beinart for your opening statement. Thank you. I welcome the debate initiated by Roads Must Fall, but I consider the statue also as a secondary issue. For me, the central question is, how can we deal with the legacy of Rhodes in the academic sphere? Oxford has benefited enormously for over a century from the Rhodes Trust, as well as other money generated by mining magnets largely in Southern Africa. And this debate for me is about the long-term relationship created. I believe the university as a whole should consider the responsibilities that arise from accepting such donations. I want to suggest a route that I think can find wide support and looks to the future. Oxford has in fact undergone huge changes in recent decades and at the postgraduate level trains a large number of African students and students with expertise on Africa. And two centers have been established. But decision making is very devolved. And in some ways that's our genius, but we don't think across the institution. I think we do have to do that now. The trust has been used as a general fund. It's globalized the studentships. They have put money into the Mandela Road scholarships in, in Southern Africa. But I think that greater priority needs to be given in the university to students, scholarships for students from Africa, and to ensuring that Oxford is a leading center for the study of Southern Africa and Africa in the world, certainly in Britain. Oriel and other colleges who've directly benefited over the years from the trust money should consider scholarships. The future of the Rhodes Chair of Race Relations, which I hold, I'm now retired, should be made more certainly a chair of African studies. And this can be an exciting moment for syllabus revision as history is recently doing. I suggest we have a summit on Africa as it was a few years back on China studies. With respect to the statue, I recognize the students' strategic acumen in choosing the symbolic battleground, they probably wouldn't have attracted the same attention if they wanted to revise the English syllabus. And I believe that the priority, nevertheless, is not what should fall. It's rather what might rise, the positive and concrete academic developments that could be furthered by this debate.
Thank you, Professor, for your opening statement. I now turn to Prof uh, Professor Nigel Bigger for your opening statement. First of all, uh, if we insist on our heroes being pure, we aren't going to have any. Last year, the Shaina Mahatma Gandhi's halo came off when we learned of his views that Indians were culturally superior to black Africans. Does that mean we should forget his remarkable achievements? I don't think so. Second, claims that Rhodes was South Africa's Hitler and carried out genocide lack any historical foundation. Third, Rhodes was not racist. He didn't hold black Africans in, Africans in general contempt. He did not view them as biologically inferior and incapable of cultural development. In 1899, he defended the right of blacks to vote. He stipulated that his scholarships be awarded regardless of race. And the first Rhodes Scholarship was awarded to an African-American within five years of his death. Fourth. While often ruthless in his choice of means, Rhodes was a prodigious entrepreneur who used his wealth for public purposes. Unlike some of South Africa's current rulers, he didn't use it to, to feather his own nest. Rather, to develop the region's economy and to build a worldwide community of public leaders through his scholarship legacy. Fifth, if Rhodes must fall, so must Churchill, whose views on empire and race were much the same and so probably must Abraham Lincoln. While Lincoln liberated African-American slaves, he doubted they could be integrated into a white society and favored their separate development, their segregation, or apartheid, if you will, in an African colony. Finally, in 2010, the ANC government in KwaZulu-Natal, in South Africa, named a new airport after King Shaka. Shaka was responsible for forging a highly militaristic Zulu empire in the early 1800s, for waging terroristic and genocidal wars, not least in 1826, and for a share of the deaths of between one and two million black Africans. If Shaka gets to stand in Durban, Rhodes, whose sins pale by comparison, should be left standing in Oxford. Thank you very much, Professor, for your opening statement. I now turn finally to Sophia Cannon for your opening statement. There is a clear moral, economic, and indeed historical distinction between the statue which is on your high street and, shall we say, the objet d'art that found its way briefly onto eBay, Sir Chaz chains from slavery, uniforms from the Holocaust, or recently the debate that has continued in the States on the Confederate flag. And it's very different, is it not, when you have people peddling currency based upon shame, racism, and indeed, misery. The statue outside, I say, wasn't erected like we see on the continent in a cult of personality. We don't do that here. In Britain, our statues are welded to our history, whether we like it or not. Now, it's no accident that I'm here on this side. And indeed, it's no accident that I'm here with an English name, both front and back. Because the African diaspora reaches far and wide. And in the Caribbean, our history is genetic. We have ginger-haired, green-eyed, freckled black children, as do I, and my sister, my aunt. What is crucial to know 
is that the critical nucleus of minds that we have on the right, in 50 years' time, their statues should be here. And their legacy should be as great. Because the problems that the African diaspora face need to be challenged. And indeed, the only way it can be done today is through the academic mind. Roads must not fall today. <laughs>